Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the first committee meeting of the African American Subcommittee for Safety and Justice. I am the committee chairman, Representative Anamdi Chukwocho. And on behalf of all of the members of the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus, I would like to thank you for joining us for this meeting and to, to your willingness to be a part in this effort and in this work. As many of you know, this past spring, with the horrific murder of Mr. George Floyd, it created a, a groundswell of just a call for action where we can no longer be silent against the, the injustices that were happening all across our country. And we, as the members of the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus, we created what we call the Justice for All agenda. And as a part of that agenda, there were a few, maybe a handful of, of pieces of legislation included in that package. But also there was the creation of two task force. One task force, which was the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force, which is led by Representative Frank Cook, who has joined us today. And the second task force was the African American Task Force, which was tasked with looking at the disparities of, in, within African American communities throughout the state of Delaware. That task force was broken down into a, an array of, of committees of dealing with economics, education, infrastructure and, and environment, health and social justice. In this committee, it was one of the, in this task forces, it was a partnership which was created in partnership with Delaware State University. And this task force is legislatively led by our, our senior representatives, senior uh, representative Stephanie T. Bolden. And we are very thankful for the leadership of the, the whole committee and we're thankful for everyone's participation. As we thought about our, our committee breakdowns and how we were going to begin our, our work, it was very keen to me that we have the opportunity to speak about violence, community violence, to speak about social injustices, and what could we do as a state? What could we do to truly come forth with a, with a plan, a, a, a action plan, a legislative plan to move toward equity and fairness within our state, to create communities that, that, are, that are safe and, and thriving, to have opportunities for, for our children to, to enjoy their communities, to enjoy the green spaces and, and playgrounds within our communities without the, the threat of, of violence and intimidation. So we created this task force and there, there was, as we as the legislative members thought of what task force we wanted to lead, there was no doubt in my mind what task force I, I wanted to lead. And it dealt with this one, dealing with safety and, and social justice and, and really looking at community violence. So again, I'm thankful for everyone taking the opportunity to participate with us in, in this work because we really feel that it's, it's timely and our, our goals we'll talk about a little bit later as far as our subcommittee and our deliverables. We did have one, um, I guess, just an opening uh, uh, assignment where we asked all of our members to really look at social justice, community violence, and to look at, at justice and safety from their community, from their department or organization's uh, lens. So we're asking, as we are just do a quick report out as part of our, our introduction, is we will go through our membership list and we will ask for you to take a, a few minutes to introduce yourself and then to speak about safety and, and social justice from your organizational standpoint. And I'll start with my, uh, my captain of my own district here in Wilmington. I'm, I'm not sure if he's on the call. Captain uh, Akil, Fahim Akil from the Wilmington Police Department. Okay, captain's not there. So we'll go to the next subcommittee member, Dr. Julius Mullen, who is the Chief Clinical Officer for Children and Families First. Dr. Mullen? Yes, thank you, Namdi. Uh, my name is Julius Mullen, and uh, I've been with Children and Families First for almost a decade and a half at this point, and we are committed and dedicated uh, and passionate about addressing 
social injustice and racial inequities, uh, not only from an intra-agency perspective, but also we want to be a voice uh, within our state. Uh, and also we want to show a presence uh, nationally as well. Uh, I certainly have personal and professional reasons and why I'm super committed in this work and, and, and I'm honored to be part of this subcommittee. Thank you, sir. We have Chief Deputy Alex Mackler from the Office of the Attorney General. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Chukwocha. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an, an honor to represent the department uh, on this uh, subcommittee uh, that deals with problems uh, that, that we in the AG really feel quite strongly about, as I think everyone knows. As far as safety and justice and community violence, uh, you know, this is, it's, it's what we do. Um, unfortunately, over the last, I would say, maybe two months, um, we've seen a, an uptick in violence, not just in the city of Wilmington, uh, but in Dover as well. And that is, it has been almost exclusively within the African-American community. Um, it is heartbreaking. It is at times, frankly, really angering. Um, and it's something that we haven't solved and are, are looking every day. I mean, look, this is not Unfortunately, it is not a new problem. Um, if we had a panacea, if we knew the easy solution, uh, we'd all be making a lot of money implementing that solution across the country, uh, but we're working hard. But, but I think the important part from our perspective is it is not just prosecuting. Um, we started, when Kathy first came in, uh, we revamped what is now known as the Community Engagement Unit. One of our first hires was Corey Priest, who I think everybody knows, or almost everybody knows, um, who is a walking model to um, how someone can reform his or her life uh, and with the help with the help of others, uh, as as Corey would say, uh, that is a central, I think, the central part of our focus on how do we turn the tide within some of these uh, most affected African American communities. Uh, Corey is he's he is superhuman in a lot of ways, and frankly, we need we need more of him, not just at the Department of Justice, but but all over state government. Um, as many of you probably know, when, when Kathy first came into office, we released a series of internal reforms. Uh, before, you, before you ask anybody to change themselves, you have to look internally and, and figure out what you can change about, about yourself. And so we looked really hard at what we could change within the Department of Justice. I'm not gonna go through them all. There's like 20 pages of them on our website, uh, but they were really focused on, on uh, how can our, our department, how can our prosecutors do a better job, particularly when we're talking about nonviolent and lower level offenders. Um, I, I can talk to offline to folks, anybody who wants to hear more about that, but I would encourage everybody to take a look at that as far as where Kathy's priorities are. And then obviously this summer, um, as, you rep as, as you mentioned, uh, Representative, uh, after the killing of George Floyd, after the, after the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, and sadly so many others, uh, we put out a series of new proposals. There were 15 of them. Again, we started internally. Uh, there were some that we have, I, I'm happy to say we've already implemented internally. Uh, increased data collection is one. And then the big one is we are, the Division of Civil Rights and Public Trust is now, has now informed every police uh, department in the state that we are reviewing every use of force um, incident that results in serious bodily injury, which is a, a large increase in cases that we review um, over what we reviewed before. Uh, we are mandated only to review fatal uses of force. We are now expanding that and we're gonna look to codify that legislatively. Um, and then we also, part of those 15 were a series of legislative proposals that I know you and I, I see Representative Cook on here are well aware of. Uh, one of the biggest as far as points of agreement broadly is body cameras. Uh, we, as of I think two or three weeks ago, we met with Representative uh, Dorsey Walker because I believe she's gonna be the prime sponsor of body camera legislation uh, in Dover next year, next session, we've met with our federal delegation. We have, a, after months and months of, uh, frankly, what was harder work than I expected it to be, uh, we have a proposal to make Delaware the first state in the country with a body camera on every um, officer who interacts with civilians. Um, it's got a fiscal note, as you might imagine. It's not as big of a fiscal note, um, I think, as many of us feared. Uh, but we've got that body camera proposal, and we are hopeful that there's going to be uh, the will and the, and, the, and the fiscal ability for our state to implement what uh, last I saw 89 or 90 percent of Americans, both parties, um, think is something that, that ought to be done. And I, and I, at the risk of taking more time, I, I have to say uh, the police chiefs, 
uh, led by the police chief's counsel and Pat Ogden um, have been fantastic and Jeff Horvath have been fantastic partners. We have been attached at the hip on this body camera proposal from the beginning. They all want body cameras. Um, many of them who don't have body cameras are jealous of the agencies who do have body cameras. They've worked really, the chiefs have worked really hard and been incredibly responsive in getting us the information that we need to get this, needed to get this proposal to the legislature and to our federal delegation. And, and so I, it, is, it is more than worth mentioning um, how great the chiefs have been throughout this process this summer. Uh, so that's that's really where I want to leave it. I mean, some of the stuff we can do on our own, uh, Representative Chokwotra, I, I hope that we have already accomplished some of the things that we can do on our own, and there's more that we will do. Um, but a lot of this is, as you mentioned, we all need to, we need to jump in together and have a little bit of trust amongst each other uh, and depend on one another to get this stuff done if we're going to make progress. So that, that's it from DOJ. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, Ax. That, that was great. I mean, surely a part of where we want to a lead part of our discussion. I, I know picking up where we left off as far as the the, the juvenile justice and the um, uh, corrections reform bills that, that we have, some of those that didn't we weren't able to hear during last session to definitely pick up on those. I know that is a, a, a key priority for the, the, the Black Caucus and something we definitely intend to push forward for, but thank you. Uh, next member is James Diana from the Division of Alcohol and Tobacco Enforcement in DSHS. Thank you, Representative. Um, good morning, everybody. And um, Representative, thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of the uh, subcommittee um, and represent Division of Alcohol and Tobacco Enforcement, which is uh, known as DATE. And we fall under the um, Department of Safety and Homeland Security. So. Um, I've been with the uh, with date for a little over 10 years now, but prior to that, I was with uh, the Wilmington Police Department for almost 24 years. And one of my, uh, the majority of the time that I was there was in the criminal investigations division, but the time that I was in the uh, community, um, community uh, division unit was uh, my time in the, uh, when we had the, uh, we had a Riverside uh, substation, and that was back in the early 90s. And yes, I, I, re, I would go back to that, and I think about the time that I had with um, then uh, my partner, Clayton Smith, who was a retired inspector, and the impact that we had um, during that time for about two and a half years that I was there with them. I remember a lot about that and how, how it uh, impacted that neighborhood and, and Sure. I'm all about community policing. So I've kind of stayed with that throughout my career um, in law enforcement and with uh, DATE now. And of course, we're, we're not the uh, traditional police agency like Delaware State Police and Newcastle County Police or Wilmington Police, but uh, we do have straight, statewide jurisdiction uh, enforcing the uh, tobacco and alcohol rules and regs and state statutes. Um, but I always fall back on um, making it a point to participating in community outreach events statewide. Um, and you can count on us for you know, any, any uh, help with that. Um, and then as far as uh, I'll use the city of Wilmington because I always go back to and I, I read all the violence that's happening recently in there and I, I make it a point to uh, have our agents go in there occasionally to have uh, some type of presence to give Wilmington police assistance, whether it's just us doing administrative inspections at the tobacco and alcohol retailers. It's just being available to Wilmington police if we're needed at any time during where, when we're there. And I think that's really important um, that we provide assistance in anywhere that we can be, whether it be in the Newcastle, Kent, or, or Sussex County. So. Um, I can go on and on, Representative, but I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be part of this committee. I'll do my best to um, uh, participate and, and my input on anything. Um, I'm really, uh, Captain Fahim Akil, he and I go back almost 35 years. So when I saw his names, I was really excited to work with him again. And I look forward to working with all the subcommittee members uh, moving forward. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, James. And, and like you mentioned, I, I truly remember those days of that community policement unit there in Riverside, my, my days at Kingswood, and it truly made a difference. It truly made a difference in not just the, the presence 
of the officers, but truly their engagement with the community. I remember the officers that coming in Saturday nights for our, our safe haven event, stepping into the community center. They truly built a, a sense of community, a sense of it's not us versus the community, it's, it's all of us together. And I, I know those years were some of the most productive in, in years of, of my young career, really having a, the, the sense of, of hope and inspiration for our children where, where they believe that everyone was working in their best interest. So, so thank you for that work and thank you for work, being a part of this task force. Thank you, Representative. And one, one quick note is that um, that's where I got to meet uh, Stephanie Bolden for the first time. <laughs> um, and we've been friends since then and I've helped her in her district in the past. And, and people like B. Dunn, um, they were some great people down there that I worked with and uh, Clayton Smith and I worked with for many years. And um, again, I, I, I think back before um, thinking about those times leading up to this uh, to the meeting. So again, thank you. Indeed, thank you, sir. Uh, next member is John Stevenson from the Division of Services for Children, Youth and Families. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, Representative. Good morning, uh, sir. I am uh, representing the, the kids department and the kids department is made up of several service divisions. Um, uh, the Division of Family Services, which is child welfare, um, the Division of Prevention and Behavioral Health, which is the mental health component of the department. And specifically, I'm the director of the Division of Youth Rehabilitative Services, which is the juvenile justice branch of the department. So I definitely have a vested interest in this committee based on safety and uh, um, community of violence. Um, as we've seen, there's been many violence acts, uh, much more of an uptick after the George Floyd um, incident. Um, and uh, some of those violent acts have been committed by some of our kids that are in the community. Some of those kids we serve, some of those kids we don't serve. Um, and so we've been working really hard to um, stop some of that trauma. Our kids have been inflicted with a lot of trauma and we've been working hard to stop some of that trauma. Um, I have a personal interest just because, you know, growing up as an African American male, uh, you experience some of the things that some of our kids have experienced. And, you know, there's a, a fine line between walking uh, a line to making sure that everybody's safe and breaking the law. And some of our kids don't walk that line. So uh, we are uh, committed to this work. Uh, we want to make sure that our kids are safe, our community is safe. Um, some of our kids are victims, some of our kids are perpetrators. Um, we just want to make sure that everybody's safe in the community and do our part and make sure that we have no policies, procedures, or practices that are impeding that. So uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this committee and I look forward to doing a lot of good work with you. Thank you. Appreciate you and thank you for being here. The next is Lisa Minitola and this is front office of defense services and I, I have to give them a, a lot of um i guess praise and admiration they were the the first group who who stood up and said we want to be a part of this you know beyond our, our task force members they were the first ones to jump in and, and join so we're very grateful to have them and, and for what they bring to the table to assist us in this effort thank you representative and it really is my privilege and pleasure to serve on this committee I have been a public defender for 25 years and the last decade or so, um, most of my work has centered around uh, juvenile justice and criminal justice reform efforts. So to be a part of this committee that's looking at um, criminal justice, juvenile justice, safety issues as a whole, um, it, it's, it's, it's very important to me. Um, it's also very important to my office. So I'm the chief of legal services for the Office of Defense Services. We are the statewide indigent defense agency and we represent about 85% of individuals who are charged with a crime in Delaware. Um, that's about 45,000 cases a year between the public defender's office and then the office of conflicts council, um, which are two branches. And unfortunately, when we have looked at the numbers in our database, the majority of those clients are people of color. Um, and, and that's something that um, you know, has been consistent throughout the years. It's also consistent with the individuals that we see detained or incarcerated as well. Um, our caseloads are directly tied to what is going on in the community. What is the level of crime in the community? Um, because we are um, more of a reactive agency in that our caseloads are driven by arrest and prosecutions. Um, and you know, we have seen those um, ebb and flow during the years. Uh, we have seen some efforts to make sure that low-level, nonviolent individuals um, are diverted from the system. Uh, that includes things like the Wilmington Community Court, um, which has been um, 
started up very recently. Um, many, many diversion programs, both um, in the court um, system, and then some that we're trying outside of the court system, such as civil citation, um, which is uh, run through the children's department and diverts um, youth uh, for certain low level offenses. Um, and, and as you said, Representative, um, you know, I, I'm happy to hear that you want to pick up on the legislation um, that we left off with um, at the end of last session that I think was cut short a little bit due to COVID. And one of those bills especially was the bill to limit prosecution of children um, under the age of 12. Yes. What we see as um, public defenders is that there are collateral consequences for our clients. It's about housing, employment, education. Um, it really hampers them when they try to return to society, um, either from getting a job or pursuing um, other opportunities. And we see clients with sort of multiple experiences with the criminal justice system. It's a cycle that they can't see the break. Um, and again, I think we need to look at some of the reform efforts like bail reform and um, fines and fees, expungements, um, to make sure that those consequences don't necessarily last with someone for a lifetime. Uh, if that person has paid their debt to society, is trying to become um, a better person, trying to do well by their families, and these collateral consequences hamper them, we're not doing anyone any good. Um, the issues our clients face, they're often structural and generational. Um, you, there, there are some families that I could put the family name into our database and see that we've represented maybe three generations of that same family. Um, and, and that's heartbreaking. And so what we have done, as I said, is we've tried to grow our practice to help deal with some of these issues that aren't necessarily related directly to the criminal defense in that particular case, um, but are more collateral. Like, does the person need help getting a birth certificate? Do they need help getting um, social security benefits? And we have a um, new partnership um, that started about two years ago with the Partners for Justice, which is a nonprofit organization that puts um, recent college graduates as advocates with our office um, who then work on those issues that like, are a little bit outside of the scope of what a criminal defense attorney would do, but are so important um, for our clients' lives. We see that the community violence um, and public safety issues do impact our defense practices. Um, so similar to what Director Stevenson said, we often, um, or not often, but we unfortunately sometimes have clients who we have represented, who we have gotten close to, who we have helped. And then we see that those clients are actually the victims of violence themselves. Um, and so it, it is a very difficult situation when you're trying to really help an individual and then that individual either um, is a victim of violence or perpetrates um, a very violent crime and the efforts that you made with that individual um, are, are then, um, I have not really come to fruition. And so I just like to say is that I know these are not easy problems to solve. I have been on multiple committees, you know, throughout my career trying to look at root causes, but just because it's difficult, um, it doesn't mean that there isn't something that can be done. And I think we as the policymakers and the stakeholders in Delaware really need to do something about it. And the time is right. And the Office of Defense Services will be a full partner in trying to work on those issues and solutions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Our, our next presenter member is from Delaware State University. I mentioned that when this effort first came to uh, conception, we, we believe that we needed a, a partner, a, a true partner who had a vested interest in the African-American community statewide and, and Delaware State became our partner. And I mentioned uh, the legislative chair for the African-American task force was a representative Stephanie T. Bolden but Delaware State, the, the co-chair is Mr. Cleon Cawley from Delaware State University. And our partnership began um, with the, the um, Department of the School of Behavioral Sciences and Department of Social Work. And we have uh, members from that department. Uh, the first member, uh, Dr. Uh, Tana, uh, Dr. Connell, if, if you're on. Yeah, I don't see Dr. Connell. Uh, I did see Dr. Michelle Radcliffe. I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute all this time. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, still trying to put my face on here. 
Oh, it's not working. Anyway, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Michelle Ratcliffe. I'm from um, Delaware State University. I am an assistant professor in social work in the social work department, and I am um, happy to be on this um, subcommittee. Um, of course, safety is important. Of course, justice is important. Um, we're just here um, just to see what is what we can do to help um, to just make sure that our students are aware of um, what's really going on in the world. We have social work students who are willing, who are, you know, they're um, gearing up to go out into the world and they need to know what really is going on. Um, so um, I'm just basically here to see what I can help out with and go from there. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Rackham. We also have from Delaware State University, Ms. Karen Holland. We'll go to Mr. James Sherrard from the Southern Delaware Alliance for Racial Justice. It's not there. We'll skip to Mr. Gilmore Crosby from Crosby and Associates. Hi, so uh, it's a privilege to be here and an exciting effort. So I'm not with a division or a department or anything like that. Uh, the profession I'm in got started in social justice work by a, a man named Kurt Lewin, who uh, was a Jewish male who uh, escaped uh, Germany in the 1930s. I uh, got to the U.S. and so social science of, of how do you create change in communities uh, was what he focused on a lot. So back then the U.S. government would call this guy, Kurt Lewin, and say uh, there's racial tension in Connecticut and so we would like your help. And so he applied the same methods that I use in organizations in my business he applied those same methods to addressing racial tension in Connecticut uh, by bringing people together and letting people think for themselves and come up with their own solutions and experiment with changing the community. Uh, and so uh, he did many experiments like that around prejudice, uh, uh, gang violence, uh, and it worked. It just, there were methods that worked. And, and they aren't that complicated. So if there are efforts here that could use plan change methods uh, that are inclusive and, and then I would be happy to help design and uh, facilitate that kind of change. I'd love to uh, join Mr. Lewin's original intent with my profession of applying it to making democracy work better for everybody. Uh, was, his goal in life. So that's it. That's that's me. I'm on three of these committees, so it'll be interesting oh, okay. to see how they relate and connect. And Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your results. To be involved. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. I mean, Thank this you. is about the plan change process, about looking forward, assessing where we are, and seeing what we can all do collectively. I mean, we all know this is a, a big undertaking, but with, with deliberate steps and actions, it, it's how we begin the change process. Our last member is Mr. Kyle Myers from the NUMA. Uh, <laughs> NUMA. 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 NUMA Capital Group. There you go. Uh, thanks, Representative. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, been a long time fan of yours and um, appreciated you as a young man and now and even into our more seasoned years. Um, and um, I thank everyone on the committee for uh, all of the contributions and your devotion to get being on this committee. Uh, this is one that's really uh, impactful to me um, at a number of levels, but I'll, I'll start with, I'm the CEO of NUMA Capital Group and what NUMA does is invest in uh, uh, businesses, investment businesses across the country. Uh, we currently own uh, three companies inside of our portfolio. Um, but I'm also the president of the National Association of Securities Professionals, which is a trade organization focused on diversity and inclusion 
for investment professionals in the financial services space focused on uh, minorities, women, um, and business enterprises. But even beyond that, or you know, prior to uh, all of that, um, I, I'm a kid who grew up in the inner city of North Philadelphia before moving to Wilmington, Delaware, uh, back in the 80s. And um, if not for uh, the gift of sports that I had uh, as a basketball player, um, you know, college uh, was not really in my future. Neither was a, a number of uh, what people might consider normalcy um, today. And so when I listened to the challenges of, of, of addressing criminal justice reform, public safety, um, uh, as uh, I think Lisa put it, the cycle of criminality uh, and the association in the family, uh, what I've been blessed to be able to observe over time is that um, when people do not see an economic hope for themselves, then the choices that they make uh, become those of desperation. And the idea that I want that I want to bring to this uh, committee is how do we impact the economic opportunities, albeit job creation, albeit um, uh, the demonstration that there are opportunities and career, uh, careers that these folks, that, that folks who have been impacted by uh, uh, public safety, whether it's, you know, folks that are shooting each other in Wilmington right now, or whether it's, you know, the person that's the victim of it. Um, how, how can that person's life be changed once they're exposed to the idea that they can have a future, which prior to me even seeing it for myself, which didn't happen until I went to college, um, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't have believed that I could do all that I'm doing today. And so uh, I'm also a uh, Bowen and Lewin's uh, systems theory uh, scholar. I've studied their systems, um, as uh, Mr. Crosby just mentioned. Uh, that he's, uh, he's been in, engaged in and applied, applied it in his business as well as I have in my businesses. Um, and uh, I know that addressing organizational and structural uh, issues requires an entirety of a plan that's working together and not just individual pieces um, addressing one thing and not the other. Um, and so um, I hope to bring a lot of that uh, dynamic and study and work to the group and uh, be able to help us really, or uh, at least help the community with another voice at the table that's advocating for the resources that it actually takes to change people's behavior. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for, for joining us and, and your willingness to be involved. We had a couple members uh, join the call after they were called, so I'll, I'll go back to a few of them. Mr. James Sherrard, from the uh, yes, yes, Representative, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. It was by my inability to operate the uh, the internet and the whatever, but uh, glad to be with you. Uh, I am with the Southern Delaware Alliance for Racial Justice. Um, this is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization, and our focus is to to, to educate, to inform and to be an advocate for racial justice and equality, and also provide a fair opportunity for, for our citizens. Uh, one of the major focuses for us is, as I mentioned, education. And we have an education committee, uh, which focuses on trying to get uh, contact or stay in contact with the school system and the students particularly, because for me personally, Education gets to be a, a, a basic component for a lot of the injustices, the criminality, and, uh, and the progress of uh, people in our society to be productive citizens and give back to the community. The, the SDARJ also provides um, uh, a number of uh, me uh, meeting opportunities once a month with the general community where we hold to host town hall meetings in an effort to get input from the general community, as well as to provide them with information about the various departments, many of which are represented on your subcommittee, 
uh, and we want to make sure that people are informed, informed about the kind of things that are going on, and more importantly, how can we work together as a community to, to resolve some of those issues, and certainly to make sure that our young people uh, have the opportunities to be productive citizens, and, uh, and, and certainly to get the general population to understand the issues involved in many of the minority communities and uh, to understand and help reconcile any issues as well as be supportive of members in, in our community. So we've been operating since 2015, started by uh, Charlotte King, uh, who has been a strong advocate for the community. Uh, personally, I am not a resident, a uh, born here Delawarean. Uh, I moved here about seven years ago with my wife uh, from the DC area, but I also have been an instructor at Howard University, as well as background in finance, and certainly want to use that background, and I have used that background, to be involved with some of the uh, high school students here to talk to them regarding finances, as well as to talk to them about uh, how they can certainly uh, overcome the kind of obstacles that they will face in the community and how they can, in fact, again, get to be, get to be productive citizens. So by educating through the SDRJ, educating the community, we're also reaching out to the students to make certain that they understand, as well as we are asking them to give us some input about things that they see that are going on. And certainly those things will help us uh, make a contribution to our community and certainly address many of the issues that this committee, subcommittee, is, uh, has pointed out as goals and objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Appreciate you and, and thank you for being involved in this initiative. Uh, next member we'll call is Mr. Spencer Price from the CJC. Thank you, Representative. Um, with regards to what the uh, Statistical Analysis Center is, we're a small state agency uh, that provides the state with objective research um, in a number of criminal justice uh, areas. Um, we kind of support uh, and facilitate policy discussions around criminal justice uh, subjects. We are also uh, statutorily obligated to provide impact analyses um, on proposed criminal justice legislation, as well as providing the state with a number of uh, different annual reports. Um, some of those reports uh, to list off are adult recidivism report, um, crime rates and crime trends across the state, uh, pretrial failure rates, um, the statewide shooting report, uh, and we also assist YRS with a number of uh, juvenile recidivism reports each year. So we're more of a support uh, type agency um, and we look forward to assisting the subcommittee uh, in any way possible. Excellent, thank you. And I mean, surely the data will be able to assist us as we in, in move forward with, with our initiative and the, the work of our subcommittee. Uh, the last member who showed up is Ms. Uh, Karen Holland from Delaware State University. Ms. Holland. Okay. I'm not sure if there's an issue with, with the microphone, but. There you are. Ms. Holland. You're unmuted on this end. I'm not sure why we can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're still not hearing you, but we we'll, we'll appreciate you for being here and thank you for your, your participation. We'll try to see if we can work out the, the audio. So for all of the, the members of the, the subcommittee, thank you all for your, your involvement, your participation as was, was noted earlier, that this initiative in, in partnership with Delaware State University 
is truly a part of our Justice for All initiative. And this, this subcommittee in, in particular is one that I, I, I was just thirsting to lead because of the work that, that it entails of, of dealing with community violence and just social justice and, and the overall safety of, of our communities and, and our state. Dealing with so, social justice and, and, and criminal violence, community violence has so often has been an issue in, impacting not only my, my own community, but my own family over the past decades and as recently as, as last week. It's, it's truly an issue that I feel that we as a state can no longer be silent about. And that as a representative of my community, this is truly one of the core issues. We, we mentioned education earlier. I'm so glad to, to be a part of the initiative with the, the Reading Consortium for Educational Equity. We feel that's truly fighting along the uh, parallel path along with, with the African-American Task Force. But this issue of, of community violence and, and social justice about what we can do collectively to truly bring about a, a change in a sense of just addressing some of the, the shortcomings and some of the just wrongs within our community. I thought of how we, we would begin this, this work and what so many of us bring to the table, I just wanna state emphatically that, that nothing is off the table. We, I mean, everything we begin with as far as our, our charge is, is what we bring. And we, we did mention that the laws, the, the uh, proposed bills for um, the, uh, J.J. Johnson's packet of, of bills. We definitely want to start there because there are many, we feel unfinished business in, in that docket, but there are so many other areas in which we want to pursue that we feel haven't been, been touched upon. And again, we, we believe that there is nothing off of the table. Our, our effort as far as our subcommittee is to come forward with, with recommendations from the subcommittee that we will present to the full body. And then the full body, the, the African-American task force will present a, a justice for all agenda, a legislative agenda. And for the, the next uh, session, the 151st session, so it will be deliverables and in action plans. We feel legislation as well as community action items that, that will support the, not only the laws, but also the, the community-based policies, the policies within our departments, organizations, and how they impact each one of our, our communities. I started thinking about how we would approach this work. As has been mentioned, it's very vast, and we, we all know it's not an easy undertaking. It really isn't. If, if it is, this, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. It, it's really, we know it's very complex. A lot of the issues that, that impact community violence from poverty, the, the lack of jobs, mental health, these, these and housing need, these are tough issues. These are longstanding systematic issues, but they are a part of, of this problem in how we begin to, to intersect and work together for, for just solutions to begin this, this process toward change. We mentioned that with, with the George, Mr. George Floyd's murder, how it, it created a, a growing awareness about the, the racial, just tensions and, and the violence and oppression. And what we as a community, as a legislative caucus, we thought that how could we alter that? How could we alter that course towards equity, towards justice, towards having safe and vibrant communities where, where our children can, can grow and thrive and our seniors can feel safe in, in their communities, safe in, in, in their homes. And we, we don't feel that our, our streets are just saturated with, with illegal guns and that our communities are, are not under siege. What can we do? What can we do? So we think about the, the violence itself, thinking about just the violence and, and saying no, no, no longer can we accept this. I mean, this, the violence in, in our communities, record, record highs right now, as far as the time of the year in Wilmington and in, in Dover and, and across our nation, just many, they say it's COVID related, but we all know that the violence was there and like so many other areas and disparities that the, the, the pandemic really just heightened and intensified it, but it, it's been there. And so for, for us as, as, as a, a subcommittee to really truly think about what we can do, what we can do to bring forth change, to, to work together, to say that, that this, this, this injustices, that the, the unfairness, within our communities that it will no longer be, be tolerated. We talked about as, a, as a, a caucus, 
ways in which we could begin this, this change about things that, that we can say that we would like to just start this conversation. And there were, were questions that came to mind and questions that I, I don't think there's any one answer, but they are questions that I think truly help to begin our, our, our conversation and to, to start our deliberations as a, as a, as a subcommittee. And the, the questions deal with just simple questions and how do we answer them through our action? How do we ask them through community action, through our departments, through legislative action? And questions that I mean, have been researched and, and studied throughout our, our, our state, throughout our nation about what, what drives community violence? What are some of the, the root causes of community violence? How do we shield and protect our children and communities? How do we stop the flow of illegal guns into our community? How do we keep guns out of the hands of, of our children and other individuals who shouldn't harm them, who, who shouldn't have them? How do we deal with the trauma? How do we deal with the trauma and, and the hurt of individuals, the, 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 violent, the violent, the perpetrators, as well as the victims? One of the things that, that touches me so often in our community is when we think about the trauma and, and the personal hurt that individuals feel. Well, I mean, when, when an individual can truly shoot and kill another individual, I mean, how, do, how what does that do, not only to that individual, but the, the, the trauma and how it impacts that, the lives of individuals, families, and, and communities, that's truly where we are. So we're looking for all of our agencies, organizations, departments to, to come together to truly have a, a cross sector approach to looking at how can we address these issues? I mean, to really, to root out violence, to root out the, the, the causes of, of violence. These are, are heavy tasks, heavy lifts, but I believe that, that working together, we can at least begin to walk in that direction, but with a legislative uh, approach, one that we believe that can truly make a, dis, a difference to fix some of the systematic inequities. And it, it really takes a, just a matter of, of stability and, and commitment on our part to truly make a difference. There is a, a, one of the lines, or, or we said safety and justice. And justice has, you know, it's, it's very, it's a, a lofty word. It's a big word that has, you know, depending on where, how you're looking at justice, it can mean so many different things. We've mentioned just uh, criminal justice reform and juvenile justice reform, but just the overall sense of justice, of racial and social justice in, in, in our, our nation, in our state. What does that look like? How do, how do, we, how do we show a, a call and an action plan toward justice in, in our nation, in, in our state? Justice itself of just dealing with, with fixing some of the, the inequities, fixing some of the, the disparities, deliberate action. In that they're from, in, I believe it was California recently, they, they created a, a task force to, to look at reparations as a, a way to say that this, this is what justice looks like of trying to fix some of the wrongs. So our, our approach with this subcommittee is going to be very vast. And again, we're, we're welcoming all input uh, and there, there, are, there are no wrong answers. There, I mean, something has been tried. If, if we have a, a, a game plan, we have a foundation reports. We know we, the CDC came here and they, they studied gun violence in, in, my, in my city and they gave us a, a report of deliverables and action items. And I believe that was in maybe 15 or 17. And to this day, we haven't fully implemented those recommendations. Why? Why as a state? that those are the questions about things that, that we can truly do differently, things that we can do as a, as a, as a state and when we make the investment in, in the right areas. We really wanna say that we, we can no longer accept the, the injustices, we can no longer accept the disparities between certain communities, in particular, mainly the impact, negative impact within African-American communities. So our, our caucus is, is steadfast, on our goal in, in to produce deliverables. Our deliverables, again, as I briefly mentioned, are for our subcommittee to produce a, a list of recommendations, rather it be for, for legislative recommendation, our community action items, maybe policy change that we can present to the African-American task force, the full body. And those recommendations will become a part of the legislative mandate 
that will be presented to the full General Assembly, which will include legislation as well as, again, community action items where we work with nonprofits and, and different stakeholders to assist in the implementation of our, our recommendations. This, this work, uh, I'm so grateful again for, for everyone's participation for everyone's in involvement. It's gonna take many hands for, for us to do this. We know that this work is vitally important. It's, it's truly life or death. We, we have members of, of our community who, who are dying. We, we have children dying. We have communities that are, that are under siege of violence. Every day, there, there are shootings in my city every day. I, I don't know how other individuals deal with it. I, I'm an artist and, and I, I write out my pain and, and I find a way to deal with that hurt every day. I, I, I don't know how other individuals deal with it other than it, it, it just surmounting and, and becoming just more of a, 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 a cause for more violence. We, we have to produce remedies we have to work together and realize that this, this impact, almost like the pandemic itself, is it, it, not being contained for so often. It, it was certain communities in certain areas and, and it, it, it was their problem, but this is truly a statewide problem. It is, a, it is an area in which it impacts all of us. It impacts our, our health as a state. It impacts our economic growth as a state. It, it impacts our, our children's our future. Our, the education of our children is all impacted by these areas. So we truly need a, a vested interest. We, we thank everyone. We are our, our next steps as we look forward to where, how do we begin our work? Our one mandate that we do have from our, our co-chair, Representative Stephanie T. Bowden, is that we have at least one more meeting before October ends so that we can present to the full body. They want us to have at least two meetings before we have something to at least initially present to the African American Task Force. So today you will receive an email with a, a doodle poll and we're going to try to figure out days within October that we can meet. And I, I think that there's gonna definitely have to be divisions I mean, some working, particularly with juvenile justice reform, justice reform, community violence, as we think about almost like subcommittees within the subcommittees, where areas in, in which we will meet separately and then come back together as a subcommittee and maybe smaller groups. So that's the way in which we can begin to break down this very just lofty task that we have in front of us. But to think about the, the areas that you would really like to focus on, and then to, to let that be known so we can begin to break out into those smaller groups. And again, you'll, you'll get a, a doodle poll today about the, the upcoming meetings. So hopefully we can get those confirmed quickly. And then we'll begin to look at, again, the, the subcommittees within our subcommittees about how we can push this work forward and with the, the areas in which you, you are aligned or truly have interest in. I wanted to open it up now for, for questions from, the task force members. How do we ask the questions? There you are. Okay. Uh, well, look, so you mentioned the uh, gun violence reforms yes, that were attempted and the world has a long history of solutions being rejected or failing to be implemented. Uh, and so uh, there's processes uh, that can increase the likelihood of implementation. And uh, I, so I guess I'm wondering for one, if you're open to process suggestions, even for these meetings, uh, because what Lewin would say is that there's stuff holding things in place here. Yes. And what most people try to do is come up with some solutions and drive them in. And if that's all they do, often the solutions don't get implemented successfully. And so he would have just with this type of group, P 
people think about what are all the things in the way? What are the restraining forces that are potentially going to screw up this whole effort? And to spend some time thinking about, it wouldn't take long, what are those things that could screw up this whole effort? And then come up with solutions to these, those restraining forces. Uh, and so have that be part of the strategy. And, and what that also does is it would get people thinking out loud with each other. And that dialogue is likely to create more commitment uh, and not, as well as generating more options for what to do. So I would love to you know, see this become more of an interactive process that quickly generates uh, what's in the way and what could be done. Uh, versus just trying to do the normal thing of like uh, the original, right at the beginning, Alex, uh, Alexander, uh, he mentioned a couple of things, which are good things that are, that are you know, solutions like uh, body uh, cameras for everyone. That's great. Uh, but that's the, and if that's all that gets done, it's not enough, obviously. Like we have to end poverty in Wilmington or something probably, right? Uh, to really have social change that is deep. So anyway, that's it. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you're open to even some planning about the next meeting. Yeah, a absolutely, surely. I, I, again, I, I think there, everything's on the table. I, I think having the approach toward this subcommittee we really believe that as, as a legislative caucus that we, we want input. We want input to help truly drive change. And that input doesn't just come from the members of our caucus presenting legislation. It becomes from all of our, our invested members of, of our subcommittees helping to push for recommendations that we really truly believe can, can impact the areas of, of our focus areas for each of our subcommittees. So again, absolutely, I think having that sense of looking at, at the, 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 the barriers, what, what prevented the CDC's recommendations from being implemented. I mean, we, we can start there and we can start the same thing for, for as guns and every, every area in which we, we want to, to focus our areas to look at what has hindered change so far, what have we tried, what has been successful, what, what hasn't. Those are the type of conversations we believe that, that we need to begin with and also to help to, to drive the change and, and push forward the, the conversation. Mr. So, Mr. Chair, this is uh, Kyle Myers. Um, uh, I was actually gonna ask a similar question. I think you kind of hit it, hit it just there. Um, are you able to share uh, some of the uh, most recent, um, e even the CDC's recommendations, but also previous legislations that were attempted um, that had great tenants to it? and as uh, you said, for one reason or another, um, there were some underlying resistance to that being being uh, done. If those can be shared with this committee, that can help this committee, you know, not spin our wheels trying to recreate a new will, but figure out uh, the the pain points that didn't allow it to go through in the first place, whether that be uh, political, uh, whether it be uh, you know, that it just wasn't really feasible uh, to help us understand how we can improve upon what's already been initiated and, um, and make something work. And, and then also, I just saw Representative Cook, one of the, uh, one of the mentors that I had um, as a young man um, in high school, uh, wild and crazy when he was Officer, officer Cook. <laughs> I just saw you on the line. Uh, it was great to see you, sir. We, we definitely will. We will send out uh, the, the uh, link for the recommendations from the CDC report for those who don't have it, as well as a, a, a overview. We'll get an overview of the legislative criminal justice and juvenile justice reform bill that, that were presented. Uh, we'll, we'll get that to the, the subcommittee members. Absolutely. Are there any additional questions? I have one more, which is just simple. Like, can we talk before the next meeting? Is that a possibility? 
I, I, absolutely. Again, and I'm hoping, I, I guess I should give one more charge for individuals. If you, if you know you have a, a direct area of interest, rather it be the, the, the guns or community violence or the, the juvenile justice reform, or criminal justice reform, that area, please send that in so we can begin to, to break into our, our subgroups. But we, we, we know that there, this work is going to take additional meetings than just more than what this, this subcommittee will meet. There's going to have to be break off groups. There's going to have to be opportunities for additional dialogue. And there, this, this, our, our direction is created by us. We, we really want to move in a direction that we believe is helpful, that, that can push along the, the issues of, of, of safety and addressing community violence and social and racial justice in our state. And that takes all of us. And it, it has to take input for every one of us. So additional dialogue is definitely welcome. My, myself as well, you can send an email. I'll be more than, than willing to, to jump on a call with you, but we, we're definitely going to need individual groups so that we can begin to, to break this work down into to chunks that, that can we believe that can be handled by smaller groups to present something to this full subcommittee and then in turn present it to the full uh, task force. Uh, hello, hey, I, just have, I have one, uh, one issue I'd like to... Uh, I, I mentioned the education. I would like to be able to get, or at least the SDRJ would like to get uh, more contacts in the school system in order to uh, at least get the school officials, uh, um, get them more aware of what is going on as far as even criminal justice, because as some of the reports that I've read about the impact of the violence that goes on in some of the schools, uh, number one, but also I think it's important to get the counselors and uh, teachers, even though they, I know they have a, a lot of things on their plates, but at least to get them involved in uh, understanding some of the uh, impact of the communities and uh, the criminality that goes on, the mindset of the students, how to interact with them, and all of that toward getting them focused on an education, which possibly can reduce some of the um, criminality and uh, the discomfort and in the school system. I think part of that too, the, one of the issues we've had has been trying to get the, the schools to address the issue of racial disparities, racial inequities in the school system, in the, as a part of the curriculum even. So if we could look at trying to identify more uh, of the school administrators to help us push down the idea of, uh, of this criminality and its impact on students in the schools would certainly be helpful and um, would like to add that to our plate. Uh, definitely appreciate it. And I, I know a lot of the education, I guess direct education uh, in terms of equity work is being handled through the, the Reading Consortium for Educational Equity. And, and that's tied to also to the Economic and Education Subcommittee that Rep, uh, Representative Dorsey Walker is heading. So we do have some links and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of overlap between our, our committees. And I, I will also get you a copy of the, the report that was presented regarding the, the school to prison pipeline in that work, because a lot of that also pushed and fed into some of the, the bills that were trying to be presented as far as our justice reform bills. Thank you, good, thank you. Are there any additional questions from committee members? So my, the, our next step, again, you will receive, you re, will receive an email about future meetings. And so please, if you can, with timeliness, get that, those, those dates submitted so that we can plan and coordinate our next meetings. And then also to look to go further, once that past that is to try to set up the, the additional breakout meetings for our, our subcommittee. 
what we'll move into now is a public comment. If you are interested uh, in making a public comment, could you please use the raise hand function? So far, I don't see anybody who has used the raise hand function. Um, but if you do want to make a public comment, please use that. And each person will have two minutes to speak. Okay. It doesn't appear that anybody wishes to make public comment at this time. Right. So our, we will finish with public comment. And again, if you do have public comments, you can also email them the comments to African American Task Force at Delaware.gov. I would like to again thank all of the members for your participation today. Again, please be on the lookout for emails regarding future meeting scheduling. And we look forward to engaging with you in the future. With that, I will call a motion to end the meeting. Second that motion. Thank you. Motion has been second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So that concludes our meeting of the African American Task Force Subcommittee for Safety and Justice. Again, I look forward to working with you guys, everyone, and for our work that we will produce for the good of all Delawareans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.